Hi, and welcome back to the last week of uh, five minute physics videos. And today I want to continue talking about black holes to get ready to talk tomorrow about some of the biggest outstanding mysteries, but I want to develop them a little bit more before we get there. Um, so, uh, today's more on black holes, and I just want to remind you what we discovered yesterday, which is if I um, have a black hole of mass M, and um, I, I consider how much mass I can dump into a region of radius R, uh, it becomes a black hole when M over R is C squared over 2G, classically. This is a Newtonian language, but for a large black holes, some of this works out for, for uh, it extends even to, to regular black holes in the full general relativistic limit. But the bottom line is, classically, if I dump a, ma a mass m into a radius r, the escape velocity at the surface becomes a speed of light when m over r is c squared over 2g. And as I showed you, if you have a uniform mass in this region, that means the density gets very, very small. It goes down as 1 over r squared. And so for a very large black hole, the density is very small, and that's what was so surprising that I introduced yesterday. Now, I just want to point out, this radius r is the radius inside of which this, the escape velocity would be faster than light. And um, we call that the event horizon of a black hole. It doesn't have to be a physical place. It's just inside of that region. If there's that much mass inside that region, the minute you get in there, you can't escape uh, if, because you have to travel faster than light to escape. Now, the density goes to, to zero as the black hole gets very large. And as I said, for very large black holes, that means it doesn't feel very... Strange when you go inside the event horizon because the density isn't very large. And I want to extend that argument a little bit. To say, ask, what's the acceleration you'd feel just if, as you're falling inside the event horizon? If you're right there, what's the acceleration you'd feel? And you can get that, of course, because, well, uh, just by using F equals MA, Newton's famous law, and equating that classically to, to the um, Newtonian force, and of course, this means that the acceleration of an object is gm over r squared. At the, and I'll make it big R now because I'm gonna. I like using big R's. Um, okay. Now that's the acceleration you'd experience at the tip of mass m uh, if if there was mass m inside of radius r, gm over r squared. Now this, however, could be written as g times m over r times 1 over r. Now we know what m over r is. m over r is c squared over 2g. So this is um, c squared over 2. Yeah, canceling the g's. And then times 1 over r. But 1 over r, from this I can write r is equal to 2gm over c squared. For a black hole, or for an object mass m where the escape velocity is greater than the speed of light. So let me plug that in. This becomes c squared over 2 times 1 over r, which brings another c squared up here over 2gm. And this therefore becomes c to the fourth over 4gm. That's the acceleration that you'd feel at the event horizon of a black hole of mass m. But you see that the acceleration goes down as 1 over mass. That means that literally, you remember on the surface of the Earth, we call the acceleration of the surface of the Earth as Earth g, and that's 10 meters per second squared. And if you get a large black black hole, if it's large enough, the acceleration at the top, when you fall in the event horizon, will be smaller than the acceleration you feel at the Earth. You'll feel like you weigh even less than you do on Earth. So, large black holes have very small acceleration at their surface. Now, that's my dog. Um, now, uh, the acceleration is, we, we, in general relativity, we give it a different name. We call it the surface gravity. We call it kappa, the surface gravity. And what that's basically saying is that it's more or less the gravitational force you feel at the surface, and you see that it goes down. That, so, um, once again, that... Is consistent with this fact here that uh, if you go through the event horizon of a black hole, you may not feel even a large tidal force. You may not feel anything. All that would happen is if you tried to turn on your rocket engines and get out, you'd never be able to do it. You'd never quite be able to escape. Okay. 
But that doesn't mean black holes aren't exotic, a large black hole or any kind of black hole. And the reason you can think of that is let's do another calculation and just say, okay, I've got the black hole radius R mass M. What's the potential energy at the surface there? Well, we remember the potential energy classically in Newtonian mechanics is minus G M um, times little m, the mass of an object, to over R. The mass of the big object, the mass of the little object, to R. Okay, but now remember that m over R is C squared over 2G. So this becomes G C squared over 2G M. And now, we, the G's cancel, and you get mc squared over 2. So what you're seeing is that, what's the potential? So that's minus. Sorry, minus that. So that means from infinity, where you had zero potential energy, if you fall in, the potential energy would be decreased by an amount, which is mc squared over 2. And I remind you, mc squared is the mass energy of any, of any object at rest. So you're basically, what's happening is, you're losing a potential energy equivalent to your rest mass which means you're gaining kinetic energy equivalent to your rest mass, which means things are moving relativistically near the event horizon if they're falling in from infinity. That's one of the reasons that you can't escape. So things are, if things are falling in, they're moving relativistically, and that's one of the reasons why outside large black holes now we see a lot of energy generated because as things fall in, they generate a lot of energy when they lose all that potential energy. That's why quasars are so bright, because the material that falls into a black hole emits a lot of energy, has lost a lot of energy on that infall process. But it means that you sort of really have to start thinking relativistically when you're near the surface of a black hole. And Hawking did, and he also was thinking in terms of quantum mechanics, and he did a calculation which surprised the world and made him famous among physicists, uh, um, and then eventually among the public. And there are a number of ways of calculating this, but that are my favorite way is, is a little too complex for this, for this uh, presentation. But, but heuristically, there's a way of kind of understanding what's going on. Consider something we do know happens when you merge quantum mechanics and relativity. Particle-antiparticle pairs appear. And particle-antiparticle pairs can appear near the surface of, of the event horizon of a black hole. And if, you know, if, they're, if things happen very short, they could probably go inside the event horizon and come out again, because remember, as long as you can't see it, anything goes in quantum mechanics. But because the potential energy loss is so great here, something can happen near the event horizon of a black hole that is strange. And that is that a particle-antiparticle pair can be, can be uh, created, but what one particle can fall in. And if it loses an energy, so you've created a particle-antiparticle pair, and they have energy twice the rest mass of each particle, 2mc squared, if this particle that falls in loses more than that energy, then this particle can escape to infinity, and you won't violate energy conservation like you would with a normal virtual particle pair. So a virtual, virtual particle-antiparticle pair can suddenly turn into a real particle moving out to infinity if this particle falls in and loses enough energy. And that means quantum mechanically the black hole can radiate. And that's what Hawking discovered. Now, if you think about what happens, um, the, as this black hole falls in, as this, sorry, as this uh, antiparticle or particle falls in, it's got to lose more energy than its rest mass. And this particle goes away and takes an energy, at least its rest mass, mc squared. So what's happening is, as this particle falls in, it's basically contributing negative energy to this black hole because it's losing more energy than the mass it had when it started. And of course, this particle is taking energy away. The net effect is the black hole will get lighter. So what Hawking discovered is black holes will radiate, and in the process of radiation, they'll get lighter. And what he discovered was that the temperature of black hole is um, 1 over 8 pi times the mass of the black hole, in units where G and C, etc., are all 1, because then you don't have to remember where they go. So the temperature of black hole is 1 over the mass of the black hole, which again is not surprising, because remember the surface black gravity of a black hole, um, so, so the surface gravity of a black hole went down as if if you work it out, the acceleration uh, near a black hole at the surface of a black hole was one over four times the mass. So the acceleration went down as the mass, um, and 
and that surface gravity goes down as the mass. And if you somehow think that particle, antiparticle, or particle creation at the event horizon of a black hole is related to the surface gravity, it's not surprising that it, 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 it goes down. There's one other thing that's perhaps not surprising. If, if This means, by the way, that the black hole gets lighter. Let's think what happens. The black hole radiates, it gets lighter, but when it gets lighter, its mass decreases. As its mass decreases, its temperature goes up, but that means it radiates more, and that means it gets lighter still, and there's a runaway process, and the black hole will evaporate if nothing else gets in the way. And what Hawking discovered, not only do black holes radiate, but they eventually will have a finite lifetime. And what's really weird is the following, which is also heuristic. If I had a small black hole, then, you know, you'd imagine only small particle-antiparticle pairs would somehow be, be relevant. And in, in uh, special relativity and quantum mechanics, small distances conforms to large energies. So for small black holes, you'd expect only that the that, that particle-antiparticle pairs would have more energy and the particles you'd radiate would have more energy. That's consistent. A, a, lar a smaller mass black hole, smaller size, has a higher temperature. But the fact that it radiates is one thing, but the fact that is really remarkable is this is thermal radiation. The radiation is exactly thermal. So what we learned is that black holes are not too strange in the sense that the acceleration at their surface uh, goes down as, as, uh, as their mass increases. And by the way, as their mass increases, since m over r is a constant, it's c squared over 2g. If you, if you again set c squared and g to 1, you get that the radius goes like twice the mass. And you can always convert um, uh, um, surface gravity and acceleration with mass and radius this way. So the mass of a black hole increases linearly with its radius, and, and um, it, it radiates thermally, which is strange, and it'll evaporate, which is strange, and the temperature it, evaporate, it, it has at any, at any mass is inversely proportional to the mass. So, you might say, okay, well, how, how can we have seen black holes? And the answer is, well, what's the temperature of a black hole that has the um, mass of the sun? It's about 6 times 10 to the minus 8th degrees Kelvin times the mass of the sun over the mass of the black hole. That means a, ma a black hole of mass of the sun is radiating at 6 times 10 to the 8th degrees Kelvin. And degrees Kelvin is the number of degrees Celsius above absolute zero. So this means a black hole of mass of the sun is radiating with a temperature of 100 millionth of a degree above absolute zero. So small you'd never see it. And that's one of the reasons why we haven't seen Hawking radiation, because astrophysical black holes are big. And they're radiating at such a low temperature you'd never see them. And the time it would take for them to lose enough mass to radiate at a hot temperature is a long time. Plus, by the time they got to be that mass, they'd be very small and you might not see it anyway. That's one of the reasons we haven't yet seen Hawking radiation. But the fact that we haven't seen it, nevertheless, doesn't stop us from thinking, well, at least if you apply quantum mechanics and relativity, black holes should radiate, and it turns out they do it thermally, and that produces a lot of puzzles and paradoxes, and that's what I want to talk about tomorrow. Have, um, and uh, I think I've set up all the framework to be able to talk about the, the mysteries of black hole evaporation tomorrow. So take care. Bye-bye.